With the I am statements of Jesus, we'll dismiss our junior church young folks at this time. And John chapter 10. John chapter 10, we're going to read, oh, good, uh, seven or eight verses or so. We'll pray, and we'll get right into it here this morning. The Bible says in John 10, verse 11, Jesus says, we're we're picking up from last week, if you didn't notice, uh, especially if you weren't here, we're uh, concluding, we did read this verse uh, last week as we concluded, but we're going to pick up as Jesus had already stated that he is the door. He's the door. What does that mean? Well, he's the door into heaven. He's the door to eternal life. He's the only door. We can only get to heaven. A person can only get to heaven uh, through him uh, after having entered him as the door. Now he says in verse number 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep are not seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it, uh, that I may take it again." No man taketh it from me. Did you catch that? Nobody took the life of Jesus. He willingly laid his life down for us. And uh, he continues on here. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Let's pray. God, I need you. I pray that you'd help me here this morning. I pray that you'd empty me of myself or sin, anything that may be hindering my my, uh, teaching and your uh, conduit of power, Lord, through me. Lord, I pray that you'd make spirit-filled listeners I pray that we would um, hear your words here this morning. I pray that we'd be strengthened, encouraged, uh, edified, um, uh, corrected, chastened if necessary. Lord, help us to see you as our good shepherd. Lord, a great shepherd you are. May we cling close to you as the sheep of your pasture. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In our last uh, study, we saw that Jesus had declared himself to be the door of the sheepfold. I had a bunch of slides last week. Is there any chance, Bobby, that you'd be able to put up the the one of the uh, of the door and the sheepfold there? Just uh, when you get a chance there, I want you to see that Jesus is the door of the sheepfold. The sheepfold is kind of a, a barrier, a protective area. You see it right here. And uh, I mentioned, went in to describe that uh, with Jesus being the door, he's not a door like that's on hinges. You come in and out as uh, far as uh, salvation and losing your salvation. He is the door that he's the good shepherd that laid in that doorway uh, where this gate is right here. The shepherd would lay and allow the sheep to come in and out. In the green pastures there, you can see the sheep grazing there. Uh, But then also, uh, the shepherd would keep the wolves away. The shepherd would keep the harm away. We're going to talk a little bit about that here uh, this morning. And so Jesus had declared himself to be the door of the sheepfold. And continuing in the conversation here, Jesus then declares himself to be the defender of the sheep. He is the good shepherd. 
Now, such a statement is fitting when we consider that the shepherd serves as both the door of the sheepfold and the defender of the sheep. Being a shepherd had many roles, if you will. And I want you to consider that as God often considers us to be, he puts us, equivalates us to being sheep. Now, how many take offense of that as well with me? <laughs> I... Uh, I don't want to be called a sheep. Nobody wants to be called a sheep, especially in these days with all the different COVID restrictions. You know, I've seen uh, T-shirts and statements that says lion, not lambs and things like that. And, and we're to think for ourselves. We're not just to go with all the sheep and follow them uh, like, a bunch of, uh, like a bunch of followers. But, and we shouldn't. We should be bold in our witness and we should be bold in our following of our Savior. And so, um, but there is a, there's such great truth to this right here. Being a shepherd had many roles, and those two roles were very important to consider as a, we understand the shepherd to be the door, and we understand him to be the shepherd that cares uh, for his flock. And through these declarations, Jesus reveals that he alone is the door into the fold. If you are a child of God, if you are, uh, have been born into God's family, it's because you entered into that fold. If you haven't received Christ as your personal Savior, if you've not been entered into that fold by going through Him, then you're not one of His children. One of His creation, maybe, but not one of His children. And so here... Jesus goes on to describe his role as a defender, his role as a provider for the sheep. Many had come claiming to be the Christ, but these were hirelings. They were seeking their own profit. They were seeking their own following. They were seeking their own gain. And while caring nothing for the sheep, Jesus didn't come to get crowned as king. When he came to this earth, he came as a humble, lowly carpenter and to be our shepherd, the shepherd of the fold, the shepherd of us as the flock. Jesus is the good shepherd. He cares for the sheep and he provides for their existence. As we examine some of these lessons here within this text, I want us to consider Jesus as he makes the statement, I am the good shepherd the seventh and final statement that we see as Jesus declaring himself to be the I am, or one of the I am's uh, statements. There is but one shepherd for the flock, and he is Jesus. Say amen right there. If you know him, I want to encourage you, rejoice in the salvation that only he can give. Rejoice in the salvation that you've received by understanding your sin condition by coming to the conclusion that, oh, I'm sorry for the sin. My sin is what put Jesus on that cross. And my sin is what allowed Jesus, what made Jesus willingly go to that cross, be nailed to it, shed His blood, and give His life for us as the flock. But there needs to be a time when you personally receive that blood to your account. The blood needs to be applied to your sinful account. So we see that here this morning. And if you've yet come to the salvation, if you've yet not come uh, to the shepherd in salvation, I pray you'll see your need for the good shepherd today. I want you to notice with me this morning as we consider some of these attributes of this good shepherd, I want you to see, number one, the significance of the good shepherd the significance of the good shepherd. Look at verse number 11 with me. Verse number 11 in your Bibles. Verse number 11. <clears throat> God's Word says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. With this single statement, Jesus is making 
uh, an exclusive declaration once again. He said, I'm the door. And now he says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus reveals the great significance of the shepherd here. We see the significance. Number one, his declaration. He says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus was emphatic with this statement. He declared that he was the good shepherd. And in doing so, he declared that he alone stood as the shepherd of the sheep. He alone is our good shepherd. He had no equal. He had no rival. He had come to provide for his sheep. And I'm thankful to know the shepherd of my soul, aren't you? I'm thankful that there is a shepherd that cares for my soul, not just my materialistic uh, being, not just my physical being, but I've got a shepherd of my soul, somebody who cares whether or not I go to heaven or hell. Somebody who cares whether or not I experience abundant joy, victory, and not just uh, not just a salvation, but eternal, but but uh, but victory here on this earth. The shepherd of my soul. We see his declaration. I realize many are seeking guidance and security in this life, and they long for that source of peace that can satisfy. And yet some uh, seek in uh, some seek in education, some seek in monetary gain, some seek their jobs, some seek in physical uh, sustenance. And man, if I can just uh, get stronger, I'm gonna I'm gonna work myself, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be, and I'm gonna excel in this category. You don't have to excel in any category in your walk with God. He's the shepherd of our souls. It's Jesus alone that can provide salvation. It's not by education. It's not by sports. It's not by church. And your identity, your identity doesn't come from any of these. Your identity doesn't come from a job, a place of employment, an ailment. It's only Jesus, the good shepherd, that gives us salvation and true peace in this life on earth. How did he do so? By reconciling us, reconciling us unto the holy God and offering peace that passes all understanding. We see here his declaration. Jesus declares to be the good shepherd. Number next, we see his dedication. The good shepherd is dedicated. If only the sheep were as dedicated as the shepherd. If only the sheep were as half as dedicated to the shepherd as the shepherd is uh, to the sheep. Verse number 11, look here. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus revealed here that uh, what separated him from all who came before him, while these may have been loved by others, and while these may have done some good things, and while these may have done some uh, noble uh, services and acts of kindness, Jesus is the only shepherd of our souls. No one loved them as Jesus did. No one loves us as Jesus does. He didn't come to earth to merely walk among men and fellowship with them. He didn't come to heal us necessarily. He came to heal from sin. Jesus came to die so that others could live. He was willing to sacrifice His life for the sheep. We see His dedication. We see His declaration. The Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 13, a great verse to memorize here. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I wonder, do we we exhibit that agape love for others? Do we exhibit that agape love that Christ so willingly and greatly exemplified? As I consider His marvelous grace and His love in my life, I continue to be amazed. He was the only sinless Son of God. He inhabited the glories of heaven in eternity past. He's the second person of the Godhead. He came to earth as God robed in flesh, and yet He was willing to give His life for us. He veiled His glory in coming to this earth. He gave His life so that there'd be a payment for our sin. Have you received that payment to your account? He willingly submitted to the death of the cross. He bore our sin. He shed His blood. And He died in our stead. 
Christ became the substitutionary atonement for our sin. He died so that we could live. What a great shepherd. What a great shepherd. I want you to consider the man-led religions in history. I think of a man named Joseph Smith. He didn't give his life for us. I think of a man named Charles Taze Russell. He didn't give his life for us. I think of a woman, Mary Baker Eddy. She didn't give her life for us. I think of Allah. I think of Buddha. I think of uh, Muhammad. None gave their life for the flock save Jesus Christ. His dedication and His declaration. We see the significance of the shepherd. Number two this morning, we see the shamefulness of the hireling. As we consider this passage here, Jesus went on to say, there are some false ones that are come along, and we just named some of those. In verse number 11, or I'm sorry, uh, 12 through 13, Jesus describes a sharp contrast between His commitment to the sheep and the neglect of a hireling. Jesus spoke of this here. He spoke of the desertion. Look at verse 12. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. You're here last week, I had some uh, of these uh, pictures up there as well, and you can see that. that uh, why was there a need for a sheepfold? Because of the dangers in this world. Why was there a need for these walls and these barriers? Why is there a need for a shepherd? And why is there a need for him to be the door and a shepherd? Because there's dangers in society. There's dangers not just in this society physically, but there's dangers in this society spiritually. The shamefulness of the hireling, we see the desertion. The hireling, when the dangers came, he would flee, he would run, he would take off. And Jesus was referring, though, to religious leaders that he continually contended with because they cared more about themselves than about God's people. He called them scribes, Pharisees, what else? Hypocrites. They were more concerned about being religious than living and looking for God. Jesus revealed that the hireling was not the shepherd. He was just a hired servant. His commitment and devotion to the sheep was much different than that of the shepherd. When faced with danger, as a wolf approached the sheep, the hireling would flee. He was only concerned with his well-being, and and he lacked real commitment uh, to the sheep. The hireling didn't love the sheep like the shepherd did. Others had come before Jesus claiming to be the Christ, but when trouble and adversity came, they fled. They left the sheep alone. These were identified by their lack of commitment for the sheep. I think of myself when it comes to being a sheep. The Bible considers a pastor an under-shepherd. There's only one good shepherd, but an under-shepherd that gets to serve and and, uh, minister about the things of God. But I think of this, I think of the commitment, I think of of the love that my shepherd has for me. I think of the love that the shepherd has. I'm not talking about myself. I, I claim to love you and I pray for you on a weekly basis. As a, it's just part of being a Christian, not, not necessarily because I'm a pastor, but, but um, I think of the love that, uh, that the shepherd gives me and how I so often fail and I turn my back on him and, and I don't reciprocate the love that I ought to. Fickle and, and uh, lack commitment and... and um, desire to follow him oftentimes and and such and and how good the shepherd is others had come before Jesus and they claimed to be the Christ but when trouble and adversity had come they fled and they had left the sheep to fend for themselves you know there's you know there's strength in the flock you know there's strength when the flock is together and when the flock is in harmony and when the flock is feeding and grazing under the uh, leadership of the good shepherd. Sadly, though, 
this truth is seen in the congregational level as well as far as, uh, as far as the danger is concerned. We all know Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep, but, but He's called pastors to serve as under-shepherds, guiding and guarding His flock as well. Unfortunately, some aren't what they appear. They've not been called of God to tend the flock. And when danger and difficulty comes, they abandon the fold to fend for themselves. And, and these were never there due to a love and devotion for the church. But hirelings there to receive payment. However, on the flip side, sheep can be very stupid. Amen. They can resist the care and the feeding and the instruction of the shepherd as well as the under-shepherd. They can be proud and stubborn. We talked about the captivity of, uh, Israel, of, uh, of, uh, of Israel uh, this morning. And, and uh, we talked about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And, and uh, why did uh, God allow uh, the Israelites to go into captivity? Why did He allow the kingdom to be divided? And we talked about the history of God's people and they're up and down and up and down and up and down. Spiritual, unspiritual. Seeking God, not seeking God. Seeking, uh, seek, I'm sorry, that should not be a good thing up here. Uh, <laughs> uh, not seeking God, uh, desiring idols, little G-O-D-S's. And we talked about many of those Assyrians and we named some of those. The sun god, the moon god, the this god, the that god. Uh, Baal, and uh, what was the one that, uh, that uh, uh, they kept having to pick back up because God would knock it over? Molech? What? Dagon. And how God allowed the Israelites to go into captivity because they wanted to serve their little G-O-D-S's. How did they want to do that? Why did they want to do that? Because there were, there were, three, uh, there were three attributes that they had. Uh, their stubbornness, they, they said, I will... I won't. What else? Covetousness. I want. I already said that one. I'll give it to you later. <laughs> Sheep can be very stupid. That's where I left off. And actually, that's not where I left off. I just like saying it, I think. But I love the Good Shepherd, his care and the sacrifice that he gives, his guidance by his word. I said, uh, we uh, learned one of the, one of the reasons why, uh, why, does the, why, did the, uh, why did they get into captivity there? Because, um, uh, because they didn't heed to God's word. And they understand, they didn't have God's word back then like we do, but they had prophets, they had preachers that would preach the word of God, but they wouldn't listen to the word of God. And when we don't listen to the Word of God, that's where the stubbornness comes in. And that's why God allowed them uh, to go into the captivity there. But the guidance of His Word and the comfort and the care of His Holy Spirit. But I also greatly love and appreciate the under-shepherds that, under that God has placed in my life. Even the ones that had done wrong and, and, uh, and such. God placed them in my life at certain times and... And uh, those that are no longer uh, under shepherds, those that, are, uh, those that have gone to be with the Lord even. I think of uh, men that God had placed in my life and used at different times. And I think of Pastor Hampton in Barstow, California. I think of Pastor Dave Tice in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I think of Pastor Paul Chapel was my pastor for four years in Lancaster, California. And, and Pastor Scop and Pastor Wilkerson and and God allows pastors, I'll go to him for counsel, for advice, and, and uh, seek, uh, God, would, you, would you help me? Would you help me formulate some decisions here? Would you, would you help me uh, to uh, make wise choices, teach me how to, how to uh, give me some principles and, and, uh, as far as child rearing, and teach me how to, how to, um, how to, how to lead and, and do this? What does the Bible say about this? I value their prayer, their advice, and their biblical instruction. Biblical instruction. Biblical instruction. Not this philosophy over here. Biblical instruction, because this is what stands the test of time. This is what is true. This is what is faultless. This is what is pure, without error. Man and philosophy is faulty and fickle and fails. And on the flip side, 
Sheep can be very stupid. Oh, I, I just said that. I can't imagine living this life without spiritual guidance from God's Word, from His local church. Why, why the local church? What's so special about that? The pillar and ground of truth, provided the church is preaching God's Word, she is the pillar and the ground of truth. When a church, when an organization strays from the Word of God, the preaching of God's Word that the Good Shepherd has allowed us to have and to guide and, and steer us, we get away from the truth. We see the shamefulness of a hireling. We see the desertion. And then we see the devastation. We see the deception that can take place. Look at verse number 12. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The desertion of the hireling had, a, devastation, uh, had a, a, a devastating effect on the sheepfold. His absence allowed the wolf to enter into the fold. And uh, by the way, it could be multiple wolves. Wolves, uh, wolves what? They, they come together in, uh, in packs, I almost said flocks, um, scattering the sheep, and no doubt they desire to hurt in the process, and Jesus knew that a hireling wouldn't defend or care for the sheep, and this would cause devastation. Hey, don't get upset when uh, when an under shepherd is is trying to help you. Don't get upset when uh, uh, when uh, somebody in a in a spiritual capacity wants to show you uh, God's word is is showing you something, and and man, they're I believe they're trying to help you. I believe they try, they're, they're sincere in trying to help uh, show God's Word. I'm glad our shepherd stands as our defense against the attack of the enemy. He'll keep us secure in his, in his care. The church as well needs an under-shepherd who will do the same, standing boldly against the attack of the enemy. And Paul knew the importance of a committed pastor, pastors, and warned of the dangers of wolves. In Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, the Bible says this, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. You know, uh, unlike, uh, unlike the shepherd here, the good shepherd and, and uh, the physical shepherds at this time that could go and, and uh, man, they'll round him up. And if that, sh that, that lamb got astray and he wasn't listening to the shepherd, man, the shepherd could take that staff and, and uh, the, the shepherd could take and, and prod that little lamb along here. Hey, get over here. You know, why do they have the loop on the staff there so they can reach over and grab him, pull him back in and guide him and, and even bop him if he needed to? You could take a lasso, rope him, bring him back, pull him back over here. I think of it in regards to an under-shepherd, pastor. How many times do I want to come back over here? Hey, come on over here. Hey, let's get focused back into God's Word here. That's not good over there. You're, you're missing out on the direction and the feeding of the, uh, of the, uh, of the flock that, that uh, God has provided right here. I think it's something Brother Hiles said. You know, sometimes people uh, you know, choose a service. Obviously, we want to have practical preaching. We want to have practical, uplifting, encouraging, correctional, good, solid Bible preaching. It's all going to have all of that. And uh, some topics, some subjects may be more interesting than others and, and may be more applicable at times. And, and if you come to our different services, they're going to have different type of uh, flavor. We'll have a smaller group on a Wednesday night. We study out a book of the Bible, prayer. We have a time of prayer, and there's different children's ministries going on on a Wednesday night. And then Sunday night, tonight, we're going through a book of the Bible again, the book of Jonah. I remember Brother Hiles used to say, you know, I can imagine, um, he used to say this, he said, uh, he said, uh, we don't, uh, we don't let, I'm not here to let you, uh, I don't want to say, I want to say this compassionately and uh, lovingly, but uh, preaching is like army chow. We just preach what we think you need. 
There's not a variety selection here that, uh, oh man, I, I want to choose this. I want to choose that study there. No, but uh, God's Word is uh, applicable for everybody. God's Word is inspired, preserved, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And so let's whet our appetite for the Word of God, the things of God. There was devastation. There was deception with the hireling. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Jesus shares with us the deception that's associated with an hireling. He never cared for the sheep. He was there for the financial gain. He was there for the notoriety. He was there for the fellowship. He was there for the benefits. He had no burden for the sheep, and he was unwilling to stand in their defense. And hireling couldn't be trusted to adequately care for the sheep. When we were starting our second church in Hawaii, I remember, we uh, man, we just had a core group of some were brand new believers. Some folks had just gotten saved. We had a grand opening service, and literally, probably, oh, we we had two families that were. Uh, had been involved in Christianity for some time. They had been involved in church for some time. But we started the church. We preached the gospel. We probably, I don't remember how many. We had five or six saved on that first service. Then comes the discipleship. It wasn't just, okay, you're saved, and, and that's it. Let's, uh, let's build a church. No, discipleship needs to take place. Growth needs to take place. And if you've been saved recently... Uh, or if you've been saved for any period of time, if you've not been discipled, you're not, you, need to, you need to be growing in God's Word. And uh, by the way, we've got, a, uh, we've got a systematic discipleship here at this church to help facilitate growth. And it's essential to grow. But I remember we just had a, a brand new church uh, was started. We had new people saved. And then we had a group of military people that had come from uh, the Schofield uh, Army base. And uh, some of them, we I don't remember, maybe five or six families, young couples, and some of them were saved. Some of them claimed to be saved, but one in particular was a, uh, he grew up Mormon. And I love Mormons. I love, a lot of my family is uh, Mormon. Um, and they, they need to be saved. They need to trust Christ alone as a personal Savior. And uh, no religion, bottom line, Christ alone. But I remember this a guy, was a, he was a cool guy. Um, but his testimony, he, it didn't line up. It, it was, uh, yeah, I got saved when I was this age, but then I continued to follow in this religion. And I continued doing this and, um, and such. And, and it just didn't line up. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I, I got to be careful because I don't want this teaching to get perpetuated into our Bible preaching, teaching Baptist church. That doctrine can be harmful to the sheep. And I remember... Uh, even went soul winning. We went out. We went soul winning. We did some outreach together, and we met, we had a big group. And I remember coming and talking to the guy. And and after that day on Saturday, we met back up at the church. And I said, "Kid, could I talk to you about something here?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." And so we had a long talk. I explained salvation by grace through faith in Jesus alone. And I said, uh, "That's that's what this church believes." And and I want to be careful not to spread false doctrine into this new fledgling church, especially. And, um, and he said, I appreciate that, and, and uh, that's, that's what I believe. And, and he continued to come, and he continued to grow. But I'm simply saying, man, there needed to be, there needed to be uh, an under-shepherd. There needed to be somebody who cared about the doctrine, the things of God, the important things, to where others would not get sidetracked and led led astray of the truth of God's Word. Now, just disclaimer, Mormons believe in, in doing religious works, religious things. They believe in baptizing for the dead. That, that's, 
That is not a, a, a scriptural doctrine. That is not a, a something that we believe. Somebody gets baptized. Why do they get baptized? They get baptized because they have received Christ as Savior, and it is an outward expression of an inward decision that has taken place. Uh, list goes on and on of, uh, of and, and I'm, not, I'm not here to to uh, to bash on on that in particular, but I'm simply saying that that there is deception that takes place, and uh, we've got to be careful. We've got to understand that. And I'm thankful that we have a shepherd who didn't flee when trouble came. He was falsely accused and he was condemned, and yet he willingly died to provide for the sheep. Jesus shares the deception that's associated with a hireling. We see there's deception, there's devastation, there is desertion. But then lastly, I want you to notice with me this morning, we see the security in the shepherd. The security in the shepherd. Man, that ought to bring you some security. (laughs) The security in the shepherd. In the shepherd. Look at, uh, well, in verses 14 through 18, Jesus is clearly seeking to put their minds at ease as they trusted him. And Jesus declares uh, the security found within the shepherd. I want you to notice, notice the guardianship. Notice the guardianship in verses 14 through 15. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known and am known of mine. Jesus says He knows the sheep. We just sang that song. He knows my name, every step that I take, every move that I make, every every tear that I cry. Jesus knows us. God already, God knows everybody in this world that's been created. But the problem is what we need is we need to get saved and that's how we come to know Him. He says, I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. When we decide to serve God with our lives after we are saved, after we've received Christ as Savior, and when we get into the fold, we serve one who is committed to us. And aren't you thankful for that? What a great illustration of a marriage. Commitment. What a great illustration of of a powerful relationship, the saved relationship, the, the relationship uh, with, a, with a believer and their Savior. He is wholeheartedly committed. When you come to Him in salvation, He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never divorce you. And aren't you thankful for that? We see the great guardianship when we decided to serve Him, when we come to Him, He knows each of our burdens and He knows our needs and, and we're, beyond, uh, we're never beyond the watchful care of our shepherd. What an awesome message in song this morning to go along. What an awesome message in song, where is Brother Nate, to go along with uh, the truth of the message here. He willingly laid down His life for His sheep. He died so that we might live. He was so committed to us that He gave His life's blood on the cross for our redemption. Surely we can depend upon one uh, who loves so much and has shown us such commitment. There's the guardianship, and then there's the grace. There is the grace. Look at verse number 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. What is he talking about here? We see the blessing of grace that was extended, not just to those disciples, not just to those Jews, but Jesus said, I've got other sheep that need to come to the fold. That's you and me. You and me. Jesus says, I I got other sheep. I'm going to give my life. Uh, right here, and uh, but I've got other sheep that I got to bring into the fold. And as we become sheep, we're also to bring other sheep along with us. Hey, let's get into the fold. Let's experience the grace of God. What a blessing we find here. Jesus was speaking to the Jews, those of the household of Israel, and yet He declares there are other sheep that are, that are of that fold, and He must bring to Himself as they hear His voice. He's referring to the grace of God uh, that would be poured out on all humanity, not just the Jews. 
not just Israel, but he extends salvation to all who will receive him. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And aren't you glad his grace was extended to you? Aren't you glad his grace, I'm glad his grace was extended to me. Jesus knew prior to the cross that he'd die for those that were yet to hear this salvation message. He knew that we too would be recipients and we would need to be recipients of his marvelous grace. There's security in this. Uh, there's guardianship in this, the security of the shepherd, the grace of the shepherd. And then we see the gathering of the shepherd. Look at verse 16. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. There will never be segregation in heaven. Are you thankful for that? There will be segregation from those that don't receive Christ. But that's not God's will. God wants all. And so we're no longer viewed in light of our race, our heritage, our social class. We're viewed as the children of God. We're viewed as heirs, joint heirs with Jesus. His heirs and His joint heirs. There'll be one fold in heaven and we'll all worship the same God. There'll be no confusion. There'll be no little GODs rising up and, and, uh, and, and uh, trying to sway us from true worship. Turn to Galatians 3 and we're done. Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Say amen when you get there. A couple of Sunday nights ago, um, we taught on uh, when uh, the preacher says to turn, it, uh, it challenges you. Turn as fast as you can. Because if you don't turn as fast as you can, you can get sidetracked from other things. And so uh, Galatians chapter 3, good job. Galatians 3 and then verse number 26. Especially if you've got a device, you don't have an excuse for turning slow. Unless you're a slow button hitter. Galatians 3 verse 26, the Bible says, For ye are all the children of God, how? By faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What does that mean? You've been saved by grace through faith, uh, but then also there's a, there's a uh, baptism that takes place. We're just talking about this baptism into Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Christ Jesus. And so we see the gathering. We see the gathering here. The gathering of the shepherd, the good shepherd. Man, he desires all. We become uh, one in him. And uh, we see the great gathering. We see, lastly here, we see the guarantee. The guarantee. Now, I believe in eternal life. I believe in eternal means forever. It's not temporary, it's not partial, it's for all of eternity. And that's a major doctrine that this church believes as well. Eternal life, everlasting life. He's the good shepherd and we get saved, we get locked in his hand and no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. I, He says, I and my Father are one. And so that includes myself. I can't even take myself out of the shepherd's hand but I'd be a dum-dum to want to, right? But I am a dum-dum sheep sometimes. But we see the guarantee. I want you to understand this, the guarantee. Verse number 17, Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Those who heard these words that day were likely confused. Calvary was yet in the distance, meaning he, Jesus had not yet died, obviously. And, and uh, they, uh, they had maybe heard that he was going to give his life, but not all of them, probably. And so word spread after the fact, uh, absolutely, but Calvary was yet in the distance, and Jesus was yet to die, but he foretold the coming events. 
He would soon give His life a ransom for the sins of all humanity. He would soon offer Himself as the atonement for sin. His life wasn't taken from Him. He, was willing, he willingly laid it down. He possessed power over life and power over death. We can rejoice and we should rejoice in these words. Had there been no death, there would be no life. Had Christ not offered Himself, he would, we would yet be condemned in our sin. As He died on the cross and declared His work was finished. His work was finished. He did the work. We don't have to do the work. We rest in the work that Christ did. As He died on the cross and declared the work finished, He secured our salvation. It's guaranteed. I'm not skipping through life, hoping and guessing and wondering. I'm secure as I've entered in through the door and the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. We have the assurance of salvation through the finished work of Christ on the cross. We're not depending upon the guidance of hirelings or the works of the flesh. Our hope and our assurance is in Christ alone. We've seen a beautiful passage here this morning. I'm thankful for the great shepherd of my soul. I enjoy his tender care and his guidance in my life. And I know those of you that have experienced salvation and come by grace through faith in Him, rest in it as well. We can enjoy abundant life that only He can give. I have full assurance of eternal life. Not in myself, not as a dumb little lamb, but in the Good Shepherd, the Shepherd of my soul, Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, do you know Christ as the shepherd of your soul? Have you believed in Him by faith? He's the only door of salvation. There's no hope beyond this life apart from Christ. I want to encourage you, come to Him if He's dealt with your heart in salvation. Christian this morning, lamb like me, are you continuing to follow the shepherd of your soul? You got sidetracked with unscriptural, unproven, secular philosophy? Have you wandered? Shepherd is calling for you to return to Him. I want to encourage you to come as He leads. Let's bow. Father, I thank You for Your goodness and grace. I thank You that You are the Good Shepherd. You're an awesome Savior. You're the door, you're the way, you're the truth, the life. Thank you for that. God, I pray that you'd work and minister my heart. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to, to see the great privilege of this truth as being the great shepherd that you are. Help me to rest in that. Help me to take refuge in you as my shepherd. Help me to be yielded to you, submitted to you. Help me not to wander. Help me not to go astray. Lord, help me to rest within your fold and look to you. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I just want to ask a few questions by way of invitation. Maybe you're here this morning and God has spoken to your heart about being in his sheepfold. And you're not certain that you are a part of that fold yet. Maybe you're... 99% certain. You're not 100% certain. That's you this morning. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you'd get that settled. I want to pray that you'd rest in Him as the shepherd. Maybe you're here this morning and you do know. You do know that you're part of that sheepfold. You are a part of the, uh, the flock of God. And uh, you know that uh, Jesus is your good shepherd. I pray that you'd, uh, 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 would, you, uh, would you say, that's me. I do know Christ as my good shepherd. Would you slip your hand up if that's you? Would you slip your hand up? You may put your hands down. You may put your hands down. 
Maybe here this morning you're unable, unable to raise your hand. Is there somebody here to say, Pastor Sam, would you pray for me? Would you pray that I would get, get it settled, that I know that I'm part of that flock? Would you slip your hand up if I could pray for you this morning? I'd like to just pray for you. I'd like to pray that you'd get that settled. Anybody at all? With heads bowed and eyes closed, let's all stand this morning. Is there somebody?